What's up, movie lovers? I'm Mike, and this is Gotta Love the Movies. Oh, you guys, welcome back to another edition of Gotta Love Them Movies. I'm your host, Mike Brown. I'm here all the time. In fact, we this is our first show back after like a two-week hiatus. So here we are. We're all back again. We're coming live, live stream on the Facebook Live. Um, if you're watching this on playback, if, well, I guess if you're watching this on YouTube, you're watching this on playback. But uh, welcome back to another edition of Gotta Love Them Movies, an online uh, film fan community forum where we all just kind of get together and talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movies news and you know all sorts of good stuff um today if if you're at all familiar with gotta love them movies on fridays we always reserve our fridays for our debate show you know monday through thursday we talk about all the movie news and all the movies coming out and all the little juicy bits of you know this and that and the other but on fridays we reserve our fridays for a debate show where we can get together and you know debate our favorite films you know go head to head um uh, I'm just gonna jump right into it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Making her—is this your fourth appearance? I think your fourth appearance on "Gotta Love Them" on "Gotta Debate Them" movies, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands together for your reigning champion of "Gotta Debate Them" movies, Ms. K. Hartman. Yay. Thank you for having me. Happy to be back. Hey, uh, you are a. Th- Three or four time uh, reigning champion. Three. Three time reigning champion. Three. I always get the. <laughs> Don't give me four. <laughs> I feel like you've been here so much. You're just like you. You're the one to beat. Like you come up with. Some... Uh, don't say that. I don't like that one. <laughs> <laughs> you, I mean, you have an actual film degree in World War Two film, uh, World War Two history film studies. Yeah, yeah, um, World War II cinema, yeah, yeah. And that has really played to your uh, to your strengths in this game so far. Uh, you've yeah. really kind of been able to to cre- craft an argument, maybe not necessarily when argument exists. I remember a few weeks ago, you uh, <laughs> you had to craft an argument as to why Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is a better movie than Raiders of the Lost Ark. How was that for you in in terms of a win? Um. Uh, I worked really hard for that win. I think that's probably the one I'm the most proud of at this <laughs> point because we all know it's not true, but I argued that it was. And like by the end, everybody was going, maybe Crystal Skull wasn't garbage. <laughs> it's true. No, no, no. Crystal Skull is garbage. It's complete garbage. But, you know, Kay, we're glad to have you back. You're a great debater. Uh, you know what you're doing. But ladies and gentlemen, I have a contender. Oh boy, do we ever have a contender. Uh, he's a very good friend of mine. I've known this guy for years. Uh, we go way, way, way back. He works in the industry. He's a voiceover artist. He can tell you more about his own credits and the things that he wants to plug way better than I. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the voice of Starscream himself, Mr. Frank Tadaro. Uh, thanks for woo, having woo, me, woo. Mike. Frank, oh I've been wanting to have you on the show for such a long time. I've been wanting to be on the show for such a long yeah. time. Yeah. The stars have aligned. We're it's here. all happening. It's real. It like, is. you're a real it boy. Is right now. I'm looking out the window. It's only on Thursdays, but Friday's an exception today. Thank Aww, you. Oh, shuck. Frank, you you and I go way back. We've known each other for quite a while. You um, You used yeah, to live in New York. Now you live in Los Angeles. Yes. Um, and you, having moved to L.A., you have really dug your heels into the VO uh, arena. Um, tell us about your credits and, and uh, what is it about uh, your involvement in the industry that makes you an expert to, uh, to debate on, uh, got to debate the movies? Well, first of all, uh, I don't remember half of the stuff that I'm in, so I'd have to check online. But there's a few <laughs> things that I do remember. I'm like one of those terrible, like I cannot self promote I'm in live live uh, Facebook right now, and I don't remember my own name. Uh, oh, don't worry, I will Cuphead promote for you. <laughs> uh, Cuphead, I'm very excited about. Um, That's right, the new the new Cuphead show theater coming theater out on Netflix. Um, and you voice the character Netflix. of Mugman. A um, Mugman, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like the Luigi to his Mario. Uh, if anybody ever played the game, uh, <laughs> which is amazing, it's hand drawn sell to sell game uh, from 2017. I think it's just had its three year birthday the other day uh so this is going to be a cartoon based on that and 
it's as close as you can get to time travel. Like I, I got to do a voice for something that it's very much like those old uh, rubber hose animation, uh, like Fleischer cartoons, the old Disney stuff and everything. Um, okay. So really, really, really cool. Uh, so that that's like something I'm pretty excited about. And then Transformers, uh, Red Shoes and the uh, and the Seven Dwarves just came out. It's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know, a bunch of stuff. Look at that in the computer. Well, you nice. are a force to be reckoned with, that. sir. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm very... I'm not. A lot of these movies I have not seen since the 90s, so I hope somebody has a mob. I'm pretty sure you're going to wipe the floor with me, but I will I will try to fall down in a, in a sexy Well, dance. don't sell yourself uh, <laughs> too too short, my friend. Don't sell yourself too short because, you know, we have, we've got some really interesting debates, and, and that's the thing. It's all about the debates. But before we can get into the debates, the debates first of all, I have to tell you how to subscribe to the channel on YouTube. So here's the thing, you guys. Go over to YouTube.com, type in Gotta Love Them Movies. You're going to see a little red square in the upper right-hand corner. It says subscribe. Go ahead and click that button. What clicking that button does for us is it helps build our subscriber base. But Mike, you say, we're watching this show on Facebook Live. Yes, I understand that, ladies and gentlemen. Facebook Live is where all the people are, but YouTube is where all the money is. So once we get enough, it's true, once we get enough subscribers on YouTube, uh, then that starts to qualify me to start earning ad revenue. And by earning ad revenue, that allows me to make this show my full-time job. So I would very much appreciate your help and support by going over to YouTube, uh, type in Got All Of Them Movies, click this red subscribe button, watch a video, share a video, leave a comment, you know you know the routine. And ladies and gentlemen, as, as always, uh, as soon as we hit 1,000 subscribers, we this show will be moving from Facebook to YouTube. So just something to be aware of and keep your eyes open for that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to jump right into Gotta Debate Them Movies. I don't know what we're yelling about! It's terrible! She has beautiful eyes and her hair smells like cinnamon! Loud noises! All right, you guys, it is time to debate them movies here on Gotta Love Them Movies. And if you want to get a debate question on the air, all you have to do is send me an email at gotta love them movies at gmail.com. It's really rather simple. It's a 24-hour service because, you know, email. That's how it works. So just send me an email at gotta love them movies at gmail.com. If there's a movie you want to talk about, if there's a subject you want to talk about, let me know. Uh, we'll put it into the show. And if you have a debate question, if there's a specific head-to-head -head fight or battle royale that you want to see, go ahead and send me an email at gotta love them movies at gmail.com and we will make your question and or debate topic. A main topic here on the show. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, here is how the debate is going to go. Oh, got to debate them. Movies will be five rounds. Debaters will be assigned which side of the argument they are defending by a toin cost. That's right, a toin cost. Uh, each debater will have five minutes in total to present their argument. The winner for each round will be determined not. Uh, sorry, the winner for each round will be determined by who crafted the better argument, not by what we think the better film or actor or character is. Best out of five wins, and the last debate topic is worth two points. The winner may return uh, for the following week to defend their title, and a toy cost determines all ties. Now, Frank, you are new to the show. Uh, do you have any clue as to what a toy cost is? Um, it's, it's something that you wear around your waist, right? That is correct. A toin cos is just a coin toss. Uh, but because of my mastery over the uh, English language is pretty terrible. Um, Kay has brought it to my attention multiple times that, uh, we are calling it. Oh, well, there's a, there's a zoom in right there of, uh, of Loki's helmet, uh, on, on Kay's page. So we'll see if we can, uh, fix that, uh, in a few minutes. But, uh, this is a uh, this is my uh, two head, two headed, uh, two face coin. Uh, we're gonna give it a little flip, flip, and we'll see who uh, is debating which round of the argument. So, Kay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you will bear with me for a moment. Uh, sometimes my streaming software likes to resize everyone's windows, so this is one of the most frustrating aspects of the show, is having to size and resize. So just give me a moment while I resize K's. Uh, I know, right? Yeah, you just want to stretch your <laughs> face up into into the upper right hand corner. All right, so let's just resize this really quick. My apologies. This is this is live television, kind of, sort of. 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, so this is this is the live. Okay, so you've had the debate rules. Kay, you know what's going on. You're you're a three time defending champion. Uh, do you have any questions before we get started? Nope. Great. Uh, Frank, you are the challenger today. Do you have any questions before we get started? No, no, let's jump in. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to jump into debate question number one. And debate question number one is, 1993 was a huge year for director Steven Spielberg. Jurassic Park became the highest grossing film of all time at, you know, at the time, it was the highest grossing film of all time, and it took home three Academy Awards. But simultaneously Spielberg also directed Schindler's List the film that won him the Oscars for best director and best picture but the question here is which film had a greater cultural impact was it Jurassic Park or Schindler's List and Frank because you are the challenger you are going to get the toy cost today uh, heads you will be arguing for Jurassic Park Tales, you'll be arguing for uh, Schindler's List. Any questions? No, no. All right, uh, here we go. So right let's on. go ahead and toin Koss. Frank, you will <laughs> you will be uh, arguing for Schindler's List, and and uh, Kay, you will be arguing for Jurassic Park as to which of the two films had the greater cultural impact keep that in mind as you craft your debates now frank uh you are the challenger and you had the the toying cost which means okay you'll be going first okay are you ready i am let's do it let's hit it so in 1983, when this film came out, I'm not going to tell you how little I was, but I was very little. And my parents let me watch this movie, which was a mistake. And at one point, um, I watched it with my mother and I went to bed and I woke up in the middle of the night screaming because I thought a T-Rex was coming to eat me. And I spent a good amount of my childhood thinking a T-Rex was going to show up somewhere and eat me. Um, this is an iconic moment for most children of the 90s. Suddenly we had a vested interest and fear of dinosaurs that we probably wouldn't have had uh, before because before that, what do we have? Land before time where, you know, everything's, some of them are scary, but for the most part, we're looking at cute little uh, tree star eaters, right? Nothing nearly as terrifying as this. Also, let's talk about the powerhouse that is Jeff Goldblum in this film. He's I iconic dr ian malcolm still shows up on t-shirts and coasters and other things today even though it's been a long time since this film came out all right frank that's a that's a that's a strong argument to uh to come out the gate swinging you know we have it, it has a strong horror aspect to it uh and it has you know a lot of merchandising opportunities uh how do you uh rebut against that mr frank Tadaro? well you make a good point Fear of dinosaurs and children is definitely a driving goal and has an effect on the populace as a whole as they watch this movie. But fear of dinosaurs isn't real because dinosaurs are not around. Fear of genocide and hatred is something very real. Now Schindler's List, uh, if I remember correctly, being filmed in black and white strips down all of the fantastic spectacle of special effects to get to the very root of the matter. And if you watch Schindler's List, a lot of the Nazis, uh, I don't know if I can say that. Uh, oh, but of course you can. They are, no, they're course. a real thing that actually happened. They are a real thing. They are a historical thing. Uh, sometimes YouTube doesn't like that. Uh, they are writers. They are poets. These creatures that are perceived as history's greatest monsters, very much more so than the Tyrannosaurus Rex, is a cautionary tale for a new generation that is so far removed from the 1940s, this being, what, 1993? I was, I think, 74 at the time. Uh, that it brings that out as a real possibility of something that could happen somewhere down the line, that those hatreds can come back. The little girl in the red dress standing out in stark contrast when you see her fall later in the movie, the sad, sad fall of hope, the hope of a generation, and instilling that fear and caution into 90s kids everywhere. Wow. Okay. That is, again, that's a strong argument to combat against yours. You know, the horrors of war and, and the fact of actual reality, the the idea that the horrors of, of the genocide and the Holocaust and things that actually happened to real people, that's, that's kind of a horrific thing. Uh, how do you argue against that? 
No, that's absolutely accurate. I would agree with all those points, but um, I would build upon it saying that while dinosaurs may have not been real in 1993 when this film came out, um, after watching it, we all believe they were real. And that was that's the magic of cinema right there, is that when we walked out, we saw Russell in the bushes and thought, you know, one of those little ones that like chicken size was coming to get us for a second. That's the magic of cinema. Also, um, as amazing as a film as Schindler's List was, it doesn't have the mass appeal that Jurassic Park did. Um, I'm sure some people brought their kids to see it, but by and large, it was meant for adult audiences. So I'm not sure it had the same influence on the youth of the 90s as Jurassic Park did. It also, Jurassic Park also sparked a love of um, archaeology in a whole new generation, um, kind of having a scully effect, especially when it comes to women in STEM, because this was the first time a lot of people got to see, even if it's fictional and fake, you know, something scientific with dinosaurs and uh, brought up a whole new love of this study for a whole new generation. Frank, whole new study for a whole new generation combined with uh, the lasting power of imagination and, uh, uh, and creativity. How does that, uh, how does the cultural impact of Schindler's List combat the cultural impact of something like Jurassic Park? Well, can you make a very good point? And I applaud uh, Jurassic Park, uh, not unlike Star Trek and many other things that were much lower budget. Uh, promoting women, going STEM research and taking jobs in science, uh, that is a noble pursuit and is absolutely something to be applauded. Schindler's List, however, the lack of the lack of compassion shown by these terror mongers perhaps inspires some women to go into politics. And without politics allowing science to breathe, I don't think there would be much science. Unless is these scientists doing things against the law outside of those confines, the very principles, the legal uh, loopholes that need to be jumped through would tie their hands, much in the way that the poor people who fell to the Holocaust were... Uh, oh, God, this is terrible. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 Frank, as, uh, just for a clarifying question for myself. Uh, you talk about the scientific <laughs> aspects of this. Um, are, you ta are you referring to the scientific uh, uh, research aspects of the film, or are you referring to the scientific aspects of what actually happened during World War II? I mean not to cite the scientific aspects at all, but the political aspects. By having women go into science to be inspired to do so by Jurassic Park is fine. But I think having them be inspired to actually run the damn country by watching Schindler's List and writing the wrongs of her forefathers is us. But in order for science to breathe, you need to allow it to happen, and you do that through politics. So yes, I do think that it inspired many a child who went back and investigated this past 1993, or those who were told about it, because it was hard to exist in 1993 without... Frank, your internet is, is breaking up just a little bit, so I'm just I'm gonna cut you off early, just just for a moment. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get uh, the connection to reset just a little bit. Uh, but Kay, uh, Frank was talking about the political aspects of the impact of of. Um, uh, of Schindler's List and how it's actually inspired people to go into politics and to right horrible wrongs that have happened. Uh, uh, how has Jurassic Park entered the political arena? I think it's entered the political arena in the way that it's under that's helped us understand where science should begin. Um, there's that amazing line. It's like we were thinking about whether or not we should. We didn't consider whether or we, if we could, we didn't consider whether or not we should. And I think that's probably where that line starts, because that's not only a scientific thing that should probably also apply to politics as well. It's like just because doing something is an option doesn't mean it's the best option for all involved. Interesting. Fantastic. Um, uh, Frank, uh, closing statement. Closing statement. Let's see. Well, we should not make the same errors we did in the past. And that is what Schindler's List is based upon. It is a learning experience from what came before. Jurassic Park 
It is a learning experience of what has yet to come. And I think we need to correct the present before the future. Wow, Kay. Um, thinking about um, the present and preparing for the future. Strong case. How, mm -hmm. how does uh, Jurassic Park combat that? I would say it combats that by the technology used in the film. It set computer generation so far ahead and it holds up. When you watch it now as an adult, it's still good. Um, there's uh, some other uh, films that also set computer generation forward a quite a lot, but really did not hold up to the times. Still, I get those chills when the T-Rex is screaming and the banner falls when the dinosaurs ruled the earth. That's all computer generated in the early 90s, and it still sticks so well. So I would say um, it's iconic and forward thinking in the way that in the future these things are still holding up wow you guys um closing closing arguments have been had i i feel like this this was a tricky one this was a tricky one i purposefully pitted these two movies against each other they came out the same year they both had massive massive impacts in the world um and for all the reasons that you guys pointed out i think for the reasons that k laid out that's what lay uh Frank, every, everything that you had presented, I feel like Kay presented um, a, a stronger argument in the same regard, but then added maybe just a little bit more to make me feel like, you know what, it's uh, coming out of the gate with Jeff Goldblum. Um, a, a, a very bizarre actor who play, who was, who was cast in that role uh, very well. The cultural impact that he still has today, uh, much of it was based on his role in Jurassic Park. I'd never heard of Jeff Goldblum until Jurassic Park. Um, and how like the merchandising still continues, um, the scientific aspects, the political aspects, everything that you brought up as well, Frank, I think that I think Kay hit you uh, with a bit of a stronger argument. And for that reason, I'm gonna give Kay the first point. Woo woo! For the record, Ooh. I was I am like so much more prepared to argue for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Like, give me that one. Nope. Okay, Jurassic Park. Get there it. we go. Uh, Frank, where I haven't seen Schindler's List since it was in the theater. So yes. <laughs> well, I, you're I, doing I, well, my friend. You're doing well. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for joining us here today. As I resize your window, because as we all know, my uh, streaming software likes to resize itself. So all of that being said, let's move on to debate question number two. And debate question number two is: What was the best Keanu Reeves action film of the '90s? Was it Speed or The Matrix? Uh, Kay, you had the, uh, I'm sorry, Frank, you had the toy cost from the last round, which means, Kay, you will get the toy cost for this round. Heads will be Speed. Tails will be The Matrix. So what are you arguing for? Kay, you are, whoop, I, just, I dropped it. It was Heads. Um, Kay, you are arguing for Speed. Frank, you are arguing for The Matrix. Uh, so Kay, you, uh, you had the, the toying cost, which means Frank, you, oh man, this, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize so, uh, wholeheartedly right now. This streaming software is great when it works and when it doesn't, it is frustrating. <laughs> so Frank, your window has been resized. You are reframed perfectly. And now it looks like your video has been frozen. Frank, are you there? Oh, I'm here. Okay. I see you guys perfectly, so nice and smooth, and I can see every pore. Fantastic. Your so your video's beautiful. frozen, but we can still hear you. Yeah. Uh, Frank, we are going to go ahead, uh, full steam ahead. You are arguing for The Matrix. Tell me why The Matrix is a better Keanu Reeves 90s action film. Go. Well, first of all, can you see me right now? We can. Good, because what you're looking at is not real. What you're looking at is a series of ones and zeros reconfigured into this flat surface. It is not reality. The news you get every day is not reality. The entertainment that you consume, even that based on real life, is not real life. It is curtailed and curated and created so that you move through this world and buy the things they want you to buy. And the Matrix introduced that idea to so many that what you are perceiving could very well be the matrix. 
There's a reason why the cultural shorthand of things not seeming to be what they seem is called The Matrix. We might be in The Matrix. It's not called Dark City, even though that movie came out first. Why? Because The Matrix was such a strong movie with special effects so far ahead of its time. More than Jurassic Park, even, which just won the last round, let me remind you. The Matrix changed cinema, but more importantly, it changed the world and how we look at the world and what we believe the world to be. Wow, Kay, The Matrix changed the world, what we believe the world to be. It, it challenged what our thoughts and our perceptions are and, uh, you know, special effects that were so far ahead of its time. Uh, what are your opening arguments for Speed? Uh, I mean, these are all valid. I mean, who didn't watch The Matrix and then go in the kitchen and stare at a spoon, right? But there are so many things I, that are so classic film and amazing, just real Hollywood cinema about speed. Um, for instance, Sandra Bullock, when she was uh, working on this film, actually learned how to write, how to drive a bus. And she actually like had to pass the test on how to drive a bus. She passed on her first go. Um, another part is uh, when Keanu Reeves breaks the glass door. That was completely an accident, but it was so genuine and so good, they left it in the film. And it's those kinds of moments that make films have such good sticking power to us as an audience, as an entertaining film. Frank, staying power, um, you know, preparation for the film, as well as, you know, happy accidents that have made memorable moments uh, throughout film in film history. How do you combat that? Mm -hmm. I mean, staying power is an important concept. The staying power of movies, sure. The staying power of actors. So what they can bring you afterwards, the amazing things they can bring you after, is very important to cinema, too. I mean, Speed is a movie where a vehicle drives over 80 miles an hour and never goes back to 1955. They just go in a straight line. The Matrix put Keanu Reeves on the map. It wasn't Point Break. It wasn't Much Ado About Nothing. It was The Matrix. And because of The Matrix, we've got the John Wick movies. We've got so much amazing, so many amazing memes online of the kind Keanu Reeves giving up his seat on the subway. Keanu, Keanu is a household name because of The Matrix. Bill and Ted was great. Alex Winters is amazing, and I want to buy them all, all the beers in the world. But what really put Keanu out there is the Matrix. Okay. Come back, if not for the staying power. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear the last part of what Frank said, he said if it wasn't for uh, the Matrix, Bill and Ted would not exist, essentially. The new one. The, the new, new one, one, yeah. Bill, Bill and Ted face the music. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um... I'm sorry, rather, Kay, excuse me, Kay, um, you know, Keanu Reeves goes from being a working actor to being a movie star almost overnight with The Matrix. Um, what does that mean to you and how, how, does, uh, how does speed fit into this equation? I think speed fits into the equation that I don't know that Keanu Reeves has ever set out to be an actor. I think he set out to do what he loved and make money from it. So whether or not like Bill and Ted face the music where neither of them probably cash much of a paycheck, it's all passion projects. It's all things he wants to do for the sake of doing it. So I don't know that uh, there should be that much hoopla tied up into the matrix of making him a star or anything because before that he was happy with what he was doing. He was acting, he was cashing a paycheck and he was enjoying himself. I would also say that speed might be more important because it gave us that iconic duo of Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves that we've seen repeatedly in other films because they play off each other so well and so casually. Um, I would also argue that um, his part in Much Ado About Nothing had a lot more stinking power and iconic moments than uh, we're giving it credit for. So maybe even if this isn't the biggest, highest grossing film he's ever been in, maybe that's not the, exactly where he shines. Maybe he shines his best in films that he is enjoying and wants to do for passion, for the, the drive of acting. Frank, closing arguments. Well, you're absolutely right. The ability to do the passion project, though, uh, that he loves, the ability to infuse this love into all of these projects and take on the lower-budget shoot 'em up films comes from the success that he has 
from the Matrix. It makes him that name. It makes people take the risk on a movie like John Wick, which was amazing. And on paper, it doesn't look like something that would sell. But because of who he is, because of the amount of focus on him in the media about how well people know him because of the Matrix, he was allowed that breathing, allowed that creative ability to give us so much, so much. And Keanu is directly connected to the Matrix forevermore. He is Neo. He is the one. He's my one. He is Neo. He is the one. He is your one. Uh, Okay, closing arguments. Sorry, I froze there for a second. Oh, sorry. No, it's all good. Closing arguments, Kay. What is it about that? Uh, what is it about speed that makes it the superior um, '90s action quintessential Keanu Reeves film? I think because it's probably easier to, easier to identify with. Because who's ever been on a bus and hasn't had a moment of like, okay, what if? As opposed to The Matrix, where you know it's not likely we're going to be dodging bullets and flying helicopters and learning jujitsu overnight. Those kinds of things are fantasy and fun, but I think this has a more realistic storyline to it, the one that we can identify with that, you know, maybe this could possibly happen. Maybe uh, maybe as uh, far-fetched as it might seem, it is more based in reality. So that's why I would argue this is the more uh, superior action film of the 90s. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, Frank, yeah, what's up? It's 2020. Reality means nothing anymore. <laughs> it's 2020. Reality means nothing more in the world. What a per, what what a more perfect sentiment uh, than that. Um, uh, these were two fantastically well crafted arguments. Um, I agree with both of them for the most part. Uh, Kate, where you lost me, Frank, you just won the point. Uh, Kate, where you lost me was uh, in the middle and towards the end. Um, Specifically, where you were talking about um, uh, the relatability, um, I, I know you use different words, but essentially you're talking about the the, the re- relatability of being on a bus uh, and more of the. Um, well, yes, we can relate more to being on a bus. There's something more memorable, I think, about the performances. Um, that Frank brought out that he mentioned about the Matrix and the strength of his argument in how. Yes, Keanu Reeves, but also the supporting cast as well. It was all of that that kind of went on. If it wasn't for The Matrix, there were there would be so many films that would never have been made otherwise. Um, for all those reasons, uh, Frank, I give you uh, the second point. Oh my God, Kay, you just had to argue for speed. <laughs> you're, you're a damn rock star. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I don't think I've watched speed since speed was speed it was awesome <laughs> it's it was a fantastic My feat it was it was a fantastic feat and a well fought fight uh so uh okay apologies um you did not win uh round number two you round uh one round number one so the current score is k1 frank one uh which leads us on to our debate number three debate question number three and that is who was the more indelibly iconic comedic character was it austin powers or ace ventura now um k you had the toy cost for the last round which means frank you get the toy cost for this round heads you will be arguing for austin powers Tails, Frank, you will be arguing for Ace Ventura. Uh, Frank, you are arguing for uh, Austin Powers. Kay, you are arguing for Ace Ventura, as decided by the toy cost. So, uh, f- uh, Frank, you had this toy cost, which means... Kay, I just completely lost my place. Uh, Kay, you are beginning with Ace Ventura. Got it. So... Let's think about the world when Ace Ventura came out as far as popular culture and the things that were happening around us and just what a hilarious film this was and so timely. And let's be honest, like I said uh, previously, before the internet, when we all just sat around quoting films at one another instead of sending people memes, this was one of those films that we all quoted 
all the time. It also was one of the films that I was actually allowed to watch as a kid. So it, the humor was not lost on us as children or my parents as adults. So I let's also let's just talk about what a fashion icon Ace Ventura is. <laughs> Those shirts, amazing. Uh, Frank, uh, the fashion iconography of Ace Ventura, also the relatability of uh, parents and children being able to enjoy, you know, such uh, such a film at the same time, and also quotability. Uh, how do you combat that? Well, you see, I want to talk more so about the cultural impact each two characters had on the culture that pre uh, preceded that. So, first of all, quotability. Every single frat guy in my college quoted Austin Powers to me once Austin Powers came out. Uh, I think a very groovy baby has been added into the lexicon in a far more common sense than all righty then ever had any sort of lasting power. No one says that anymore. However, I want to talk about The Office. The show, The Office. You have two characters in The Office. One was set up to be sort of an antagonist so to speak, especially in the first two seasons, Michael Scott. And one is the hero that guides us through the office. I'm going someplace here. Jim. Now, Jim, at some point, references Austin Powers by making Dwight say shagadelic baby every time he does something or coughs, right? Yet, it's Michael Scott who does the speaking from the ass bit from Ace Ventura. the other one, the Jim Carrey Ace movie. Yeah, Ace thank Ventura. you. Uh, from Ace Ventura. So clearly we are meant to demonize Ace Ventura as he has been throughout history since the 90s. But Austin Powers is a shining beacon of light that heroes reference. A shining beacon of light that heroes reference as opposed to the villains uh, characterized therein as Ace Ventura. Kay, how do you combat that? I would argue that Michael Scott is the hero of The Office, the complete opposite of what uh, my opponent has suggested. And while uh, he's uh, the scene where Pam says he I know his uh, how he is and he skipped the East Ventura talking butt bit. Um, that was not a high point for that character. That was a low point for that character. And if there's any part of a film in cinema that audiences can identify with, it's usually the low points. So, uh, Frank, Kay's pretty much negated your argument on, on that particular point, but you uh, had me when it came to uh, the, the, um, uh, the quotability of Austin Powers as opposed to the quotability from Kay's uh, mm. argument uh, for Ace Ventura. Um, in terms exactly. of an, icon an indelible, iconic, comedic character uh, mm. with Austin Powers, Closing arguments, final arguments. What is it about Austin Powers that has the staying power and that has uh, a, a more uh, relatability to him? Well, Jim Carrey and Mike Myers are both brilliantly talented comedians. The characters are not the actors. However, Ace Ventura is very stunted in comparison because the character of Ace does not grow. By the end of the movie, he's the same character that he was in the beginning. You're going to get the same jokes. You're going to get the same reactions to the same stimuli. However, Austin Powers, he grows. He learns to love. He does this while still continuing to be funny because funny is not his identifying character trait. Funny is just who he is in this world that is constantly changing, that he is reacting to, that by the end of the movie, it is a changed Austin Powers. And by the time we get to Goldmember, that is a loving, caring Austin Powers that has learned how to feel. Austin Powers is a human. Ace Ventura is a cartoon. Wow. K. Um, you know, uh, jokes that, you know, are recycled and keep going and going and going until they die out as opposed to learning and changing with the character. How do you, uh, in your final arguments, how do you combat that? Well, Ace Ventura may be a cartoon, but who doesn't love cartoons? I mean, since since what have cartoons been a bad thing to be uh, compared to? I would also argue that there was more for Jim Carrey to do in this film because he didn't write it. He had to interpret someone else's script and someone else's direction and turn it into this iconic character. As to where Mike Myers, uh, it was his own script. He wrote it. He knew what it was about. He knew what it was going for. As to where Jim Carrey had to work for it. 
Well, there it is. Closing arguments right there. Um, again, like two, like these are really strong arguments, uh, and which makes my job a little difficult in trying to say like, well, you both make really great points. If I have to choose a winner, uh, for this particular round, round which I do, um, Frank, congratulations. You won the point for this round. Um, I think think and again it comes it comes down to the ending argument uh k again where you lost me was uh was your argument where um pretty much basically what you just said and saying that like what's wrong with cartoon characters i think specifically in this character um those like to frank's point those jokes kind of tend to get stale a little bit and also the point that you made about mike myers created the character of austin powers i don't as opposed to Jim Carrey having to interpret somebody else's work, um, I, I don't feel like that played. I don't feel like that applied. So for those reasons, that's why I give Frank the point in round number three. Frank, congratulations, my friend. It's only because you got that movie and I got this movie. That's it. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, you're, you, you've just defended Speed and Ace Ventura against like these two to four movies. I mean, you're, the you're the real winner here. Oh, my God. Right. Thank you. Again, Mike, save us. Uh, well, hey, you're uh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. I... That's like the 1994 Fantastic Four, and then the one that came out like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> They're both awful. Yeah. It will happen. It will happen. Just give it time. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, moving into round number four, we're gonna have to do some speed rounds. We've only got another fifteen minutes of the show left, so we're gonna we're gonna barrel into this. So let's just jump right into debate question number four. Debate question number four is: Which witchy film was witchier, The Craft or Hocus Pocus? Which witchy film was witchier, The Craft or Hocus Pocus? Um, who had the toy cost for the last round? Frank, uh, I believe. So, okay, you'll be having the toy cost in this round. Uh, heads is The Craft, Tails is Hocus Pocus. Okay, you are arguing for Hocus Pocus. Frank, you are arguing for The Craft, which means, Frank, you will go first, my friend. Tell me... Why? Why was the craft uh, the witchy of uh, uh, which witchier? Which witchy film was witchiest or witchier? Well, as a recovering goth from the nineties, the craft infuses a reality to things. What Hocus Pocus does is make light of necromancy. Is something that is a very real threat out there. Bringing back the dead, curses. These are turned into these cartoons, and yes, everybody loves cartoons, but to that point, by taking away the teeth from the dog, or rather, hiding the teeth from the dog, you create a very complacent populace. What the craft does is show that these things are real, and if you mess with powers beyond your understanding, bad things can happen. Wow. Dark and scary on us, Frank. Um, so let's uh, maybe maybe switch to a lighter tone. Kay, what is it about uh, Hocus Pocus that makes it uh, the, the, the witchier film? So let's talk about the concept of spoopy. I don't know if this is a word that we've all heard about, but it's this iconic, wonderful algamation of the spooky, gory weirdness of Halloween. And just the fun nonsense that it can bring about creates this whole world of spoopy. And this film is the absolute perfect spoopy film. You've got witchcraft, you've got zombies, uh, you've got uh, not witches writing vacuums, um, iconic muse songs like I Put a Spell on You, which I'm sure most of us heard before we even actually saw the film. Uh, this film really brings together the spirit and the fun of Halloween while still remaining very witchy. Ooh, interesting. Uh, spoopy. I've never heard that term before. The spoop. So we know which of the two films is spoopier. Uh, Frank, how do you uh, argue against spoopy? Well, yes, it is spoopy. It is whimsical. And there are memorable songs from it, I guess. I mean, I'm a bit old, so I mean, it wasn't really for me. I didn't really watch it very much. Hocus Pocus was for, was for a younger generation. Uh, the craft was something that more appealed to me. But I will say it does bring up an interesting point. It makes light of something that people are very interested in. There's a lot of nerds, geeks, outcasts in the 90s at the time that are interested in these 
more esoteric topics, science fiction, horror. You walk into a room and you see how I can isolate myself from the zombies were they to be outside. And this was a genuine interest of an entire group of people, people that probably would have been main characters in the cast, mind you. They probably would have all hung out together, the freaks, the geeks. And what Hocus Pocus does is mock them. It turns them into caricatures. It says, this thing that you have passion about, these ideas, these notions of entertainment that you choose to choose, this is silly. This is kid stuff. It makes light of the passion of a group of people, and that is just wrong. Wow, okay. Hocus Pocus being in not just an inferior film, but kind of an insult to uh, witchcraft in and of itself. Uh, how do you uh, combat that? I would combat it by saying that that may be the case, but you can't expect kids to watch The Craft. It's a scary movie. This film offers kids uh, a way into that world that is on their level, that is full of fun and full of color, while still getting the witchiness across to the audience. It also bridges a gap between Halloween and family films. I mean, we can't, uh, or gosh, Nightmare Before Christmas probably being the only one that I can think of, but finding a Halloween film that isn't terrifying that I can share with my nieces and nephews that still has that aspect of witchiness and Halloween, this is that film. And thinking about the three leads who are these beautiful, stunning powerhouses of women turning themselves into these witches so iconically and beautifully with just, I don't know, big hair and funny and large teeth. It's something that we could all emulate as kids and, you know, do for ourselves. As opposed to the craft, that's not something children can really watch. All right, final arguments. Going into a, a final final round, final arguments? Final argument round. You know what I'm trying to say. Uh, final arguments. <laughs> I just there's like this idea on the tip of my brain and I just can't quite access it. Uh, so final arguments, Frank. Uh, what is it about uh, the craft that makes it, you know, the superior film? Well, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you just said, because what Hocus Pocus does do is make a very easily digestible pill for witchcraft for little children. But I will also say that you should be not scared of the monster under your bed, but respect it. And what Hocus Pocus does is it doesn't respect that fear. The monsters out there that can hurt you, the ideas out there that can hurt you. What the craft does is say, there are real things out there that can harm you. Don't be afraid. Respect them. Wow, don't be afraid. Respect them. Okay, final arguments. I would argue that it does tell you to respect them and have fun with it. Uh, what what's the point of power if you can't enjoy it? What's the point of uh, being able to change things and do things if you never take that opportunity? And the characters in the craft do that, but not right and not well, and it has horrible repercussions. As to where Hocus Pocus, they do that, and it ends up being a good time. All right, wow. Um, so here's here's where I'm standing. Um, I like the spirit of the question was, which was the witchier film? Um, I feel like I got a lot of that from Frank and Kay. I got a lot from you as to why it's a fun movie, why it's more accessible, but not a lot of reasons as to why it was the witchier film for, for a more fun, um, accessible film. A hundred percent. I totally agree with you. I would have given you, given you the point, but not a lot of, uh, staying power when it comes to which was the witchier film, and that is why the point is going to Frank this one. <laughs> Woo -hoo! So Frank, you are at three. <laughs> K, you are at one. But that doesn't mean that you uh, have uh, lost just yet, which we because we are going into round number five, and round number five is worth two points. And here we go. Question, debate, debate question number five. Now, it should be worth noting that neither one of our debaters have uh, been told this question in advance. They're going to the, into this cold. What film from the 90s holds up best in 2020? What film from the 90s holds up best in 2020? I will let you both pontificate this for just a moment. 
And while you are pontificating which film from the 90s holds up best in 2020, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't already done it, head on over to YouTube.com, type in Gotta Love Them Movies, you'll see a little red square in the upper right-hand corner that says subscribe. Go ahead and click that square or click that button. Uh, what doing that does is it helps build our subscriber base. And yes, I understand you are watching this show right now on Facebook Live, but you may not actually be you might be watching this on youtube and by building our subscribers you help uh help us earn more uh uh opportunity to build that subscriber base and building the subscriber base means more ad revenue and ad revenue means i get to make this job or this show my full-time job so uh if you haven't already done that i highly recommend that you head on over to youtube.com and subscribe to the channel so let's head back over to our uh contestants Contestants? Sure. How about that? Contestants. Okay. Um, which film have you chosen from the 90s that holds up the best in 2020? Oh, the iconic film Space Jam. Ooh, Space Jam. Ooh. And Frank, for yourself, uh, what film from the 90s holds up best in 2020? Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. <gasps> Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey versus Space Jam. Ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a fight. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Frank, uh, let's see. Kay, you were the first person to uh, start arguing or debating in the last round. So, Frank, you are going to kick this one off. Go. Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. The soundtrack alone introduced a generation to hair metal they would not have been exposed to prior to that and infusing it with the music of the day shredding guitars became a thing again it changed pop culture in that way but it also offered a solid marriage of science fiction and theology that was unseen in movies prior to that very rarely you have one or the other so outside of what we've already established as the glory that is keanu reeves that has been given to us from the heavens being solidified in this where his comedic chops were tested, playing not one, but two, perhaps three versions of himself, if you count the uh, good robot us's. And I think he grunted for one of them. Uh, and God gave rock and roll. He gave it to everyone. Okay, opening arguments for uh, Space Jam. So... I see your Keanu Reeves, and I raise you the powerhouse that is... <laughs> the combination of Michael Jordan and Bill Murray. Let's talk, and also let's talk about iconic soundtracks. I believe I can fly. Hello, that song was the song of the 90s and people still play it at weddings today. Let's be completely honest with ourselves. This is, the song has the most sticking power out of any of uh, anything on Bill and Ted's soundtrack for real. Staying power. Uh, what, uh, oh, Frank, Frank, we've zoomed in on your uh, upper right hand corner there. Uh, so staying power uh, in terms of music and, you know, the iconography of uh, Space Jam itself. Frank, how do you argue against that? I mean, I just disagree. I didn't like that song as much. However, the uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey soundtrack made me bond with Mike Wissell in first week of high school and through him, I met Mike Burke and Dan Reiser and Nico Bacchus, and none of you guys know all these people. Matt uh, Spano, and those are my best friends today. Uh, I still play with them, play Dungeons and Dragons with them via Zoom every uh, every Saturday night. And uh, since 1991, which is the year that Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey came out. So personal lasting power, I believe I can fly. I don't think that has ever, I believe that has ever played off of any speaker that I've owned. However, the Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey soundtrack, if we're just talking about music, I entertain that entire collection. And it is glorious, not to mention the uh, Evan Dorkin comic that it uh, gave us after that from, I believe, Oni Press. Brilliant, brilliant series, whip smart. And I'm sorry, Lynn Sadler as uh, as death trumps even Bugs Bunny. Wow, death trumping Bugs Bunny. Um, uh, Kay, if you can uh, put together a final argument for me, we're uh, running up on the uh, pretty close to the hour now. Uh, if you can put together your best closing argument, what is it about Space Jam that is a superior film, and what makes it more relevant in 2020 today? 
granted that we see in films and in television all the time now is the association of an animated character and a live action character. Even in the 90s, this was still a hard thing to accomplish. It had been done previously, but it hadn't been done quite this seamlessly. And now we still see it in um, modern TV, modern films, and getting to see it so seamlessly in 1996 when computer generation was in its infancy, it led, as mentioned earlier with another film, it holds up. Um, not only that, um, there is a new Space Jam in the works. It was supposed to come out this year, but because of COVID, it's been postponed. But I think it has that iconic staying power of the fact that it's still going to happen and it's going to happen with a modern cast and hopefully, you know, bring Looney Tunes um, to a new generation. So I think the sticking power is within the animation, the cast, the soundtrack. It's just the perfect 90s film. Frank, uh, final arguments. Uh, Space Jam has the perfect uh, soundtrack, cast, uh, staying power, animation, infancy, uh, influencing the industry. Um, in the next uh, thirty seconds, how do you uh, how do you wrap that up? Combat the animation with the animatronics and voice uh, prowess of Frank Welker with st both station in both his individual forms and combined form. The soundtrack is phenomenally more lasting. I mean, don't really think many people listen to the soundtrack of Space Jam outside of an ironic sense, but Bill and Ted had real music. And so far as sequels, Bill and Ted, we've already established, Face to Music was a passion project. They didn't make a ton of money like Warner Brothers is going to make on that Space Jam movie. They did it out of love of the franchise because not only they love it, but the fans love it. Wow, you guys, these... I didn't think it was going to be this tough in this particular round when, you know, Frank, when you first uh, started, uh, you were talking about uh, Bill and Ted's bogus journey. And the first thing that popped out to my mind is um, there they drop some uh, 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 slurs against the gay community as just here you go. Ta da. And that was that was one of the first things that popped out of my mind. Nobody brought that up in the arguments, but I'm going to bring it up here. Um, so, I, you know, I. I I can't go by off uh, off of what my personal thoughts and feelings about the film are. I have to go off of the arguments. And Kay, I th honestly, I feel like you had the superior argument here. That I mean, yeah, Frank, uh, you, you mentioned your personal relationship with uh, some of the cast and crew from uh, uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Um, I don't feel that that was necessarily relevant. Uh, uh, yes, uh, relevant. As to yeah, <laughs> it took me a minute. Uh, I don't think that was necessarily uh, relevant as to why that makes it a better film in a 2020 context. Um, but uh, with the animation, Kay, you had me with the animation. You had me with the cast, um, the Bill Murray and um, the soundtrack. I feel that you know, I feel that it does have a good enough soundtrack like frank you said that nobody listens to the soundtrack outside of an ironic sense and i actually kind of do non-ironically um actually uh it's, fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a fun movie anyway uh that's for that reason i'm gonna give k the two points for this particular round um so yay so here's what this means normally you guys we would go into a tiebreaker round um, the tiebreaker round I already have uh, prepared and everything, but we are currently two minutes over our time, uh, a lot of time slot. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end the show next week, next Friday, providing show never again. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you say that again? <laughs> I broke it. Thank you. Sorry. I said, this is the end of the show. It's peaked. That's it. End we're done. End of the show. It's peaked. Uh, we're done. So here's what we're going to do, guys. Um, next week. If both Kay and Frank are available, and I will let everybody know out on the social medias, um, if they are both available, I am inviting both of you back for a second head-to-head -head debate. You are both tied at three points each. So next show will be, uh, you know, same same format. It's a wash at this point. It's a draw. Um, you have both tied. Um, but yeah, I invite both of you back onto the show next week for another head-to-head -head debate, uh, Kay versus Frank, and we'll just kind of see where it goes. Kay Hey, do you accept this challenge? Absolutely. Frank, do you accept this challenge? Damn right. Oh. <laughs> 
Ooh, all right. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to, uh, to leave you on a cliffhanger, but you know what? Sometimes cliffhangers are the best hangers to have. Uh, Great movie, so, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, what? Uh, sorry, hang on one second. I, in order for people to hear you, Frank, you have to be on screen, and I've already navigated away. Uh, really? Oh, sorry. What was that? What did you say? That was a terrible joke. I just said it was a great movie, too. Please move on. <laughs> totally worth it. Totally worth going back. Uh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, if you like this video, please click like. If you really like this video, click subscribe. And if you really, really like this video, click share. Because that is exactly what uh, Frank Todaro from the F Transformers franchise would want you to do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike Brown. I've been your host. Uh, please come back and see us again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday will be our debate show. Uh, Monday will be, we'll be going back to the normal, uh, plain routine. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a weird world. Please speak kind words to each other. Everybody has thoughts and opinions and stuff about stuff. So like I said, uh, speak kind words to each other. If you have an opportunity to infuse a little bit of kindness into the world, please take that opportunity. Anyway, I will see you all bright and early in the afternoon on Monday.